Welcome, friends, to this third and final day of our three-day event in Southern California. I was very happy to meet so many of you on this trip and share with you the teachings of a great master, Hazur Maharaj Baba Savan Singh. Picture you can see here. He changed my life and life of thousands of others. Visible change, which I could see in the others. And others could see in me, which I couldn't see in myself, but others could see. So when such an objective change takes place, there is something going on. We talk of finding the truth, finding God, finding the Creator, finding ourselves. All these things are built into our spiritual system, our spiritual self, which I call the soul. It is not built into our mind. Our mind thinks and it has the ability to create experiences with the help of the soul, with, empowered by the soul, experiences outside of itself. That means it creates an experience in time and space which is not within but outside. And that is why the attention that works through the mind, attention which is a function of the soul, works through the mind and becomes mental attention, and the attention goes continuously to the created universes, the created world that we live in outside. Mind is constantly taking us outside. Even when we hear that we should find the truth within ourselves, the mind looks for it outside. You have, you have come here, you come to this meeting for the purpose of finding truth. It's outside. We go to church, our man-made man -made church, man-built church, temple, mosque, synagogue, outside. Even truth that we think we have to find is outside. That's what we think. That's how we search. We read about it. We read books. We hallowed those books. We make them holy by calling them scriptures. We associate them with enlightened people. And all the books and all those authors or those whose, whose authorship led to those books say the truth is inside. We look for them in the books which we read. Sometimes we read the books over and over again. Maybe we'll get more truth out of it. Sometimes we think merely reading the books is giving us enlightenment because what is just simple mental understanding of something we consider as enlightenment. Mental understanding is to put something together by logic. It should make sense. We are using logic to understand truth and reality. It should make sense. Logic, if those of you have studied the principles of logic, logic is of two kinds, deductive logic and inductive logic. We employ both every day. Deductive logic says that if, I am giving an example, if this whole wall is painted white, then that part of the wall is also white. That is deductive logic. No amount of deductive logic ever goes beyond the data, the premises provided to it. We're just going around with the same data and drawing conclusions within that data. No information, no new information. Deductive logic does not add to knowledge. It adds to our understanding of something with several parts and looking at one part and another and putting them in a logical order to make sense. Then there's inductive logic that you can have an inductive awareness of something which says if this whole wall is painted white and the other side is also part of this wall, that must also be painted white. It relies upon the law of probability, which we take 
as a very important law. And we think that's how we can have knowledge. But supposing the other wall is painted red, inductive knowledge will still say it is white. Till you go and see it. But we don't go and see anything. We just use logic for our understanding and knowledge. These two systems of logic which makes for rational thinking, that's rationality. For rational thinking, have big limitation. One does not lead to anything new, the other is leading to some perhaps, some maybe. Maybe this is white, that may be white. It cannot say certainly it's white. So there is no certainty in inductive logic. And there's no added knowledge in deductive logic. And that's our mainstay in rational thinking. And that's how we try to come to conclusions. So this whole process of understanding with the mind is very limited. And therefore, it cannot go beyond what the premise is. It remains within the premise, the rest is guesswork. What is our premise? The premise for the mind is an empirical premise. Empirical means what it can see outside. This universe is the empirical stage to examine for the mind. Because it has no other premise, it has no other data to go into. It looks at the data in front of it and comes to conclusions. If it doesn't work outside, they get rejected. If there is something totally beyond what we can see outside, it neither understands nor makes sense of it. Big limitation. The intellectual process, which consists of understanding logically, has this such a big limitation, but we don't see it. We keep on thinking that by reading more, by understanding more, we'll find out the truth. And I'll tell you something. This world is full of contradictions. The data is full of contradictions. Today, they can't even say if light is a wave motion or a particle. They can't even quantify what is a quanta, what is quantum physics. They left in the lurch. Unanswered questions in science. So many contradictions in science. Newton thought one way, Einstein thought another way. We believe Newton was right. No, now Einstein is right, now Einstein is also wrong. New information. When you keep on adding information, logic fails. It is based upon the existing data known to you. The other big limitation in trying to make sense of things and to use rationality is how much data can you observe at one time? You can't observe totality. You can only observe partial. And partial is so limited, it does not give you an idea what the whole is. I gave an example the other day. Here is my great master's picture. I look at it. I don't see the picture piecemeal. I see the whole picture. And the picture becomes a life for me, brings me my memory back when I saw the man whose picture this is. It makes me feel filled with joy. Here's the picture of the man who gave me all the happiness of the world. Feel good. Supposing I take this picture here and take a pair of scissors and begin cutting it into one square inches and make a heap of the same picture on this table. And then I say, the picture of my master is on this table, but it's in little pieces. Let's see the whole picture. And we start seeing the picture piece by piece, piece by piece. I can see the whole lot of pieces, thousands of times, I'll never see this picture. What are we doing with the data in regard to this universe? We are using scissors of time and space to cut it. You here and there, today and yesterday and tomorrow. It cuts our experience by time, by space, what's here, what's not here, what's there. We can't see everything together. Therefore, we are seeing piece by piece, we can't see the whole at all. Therefore, the whole ability to have total data in order to use the mind to understand it is missing. So I'm bringing out this point to tell you that the mind is not the appropriate, appropriate thing in us, appropriate part of consciousness that can realize the truth which has to be seen as a whole. Now, 
is there something else in us which can see the whole besides the mind of course we ourselves supposing we don't rely on the mind but rely on our own self we can see the whole the entire truth the entire data and when i say we ourself i agree the self can see the entire data can see the whole picture at any time so the question boils down to the same that i brought up the other day that what is the self are these eyes looking at the world as self no they are say, seeing too little are these ears the self no is this body the self no are our sense perception the self no is a thinking mind which only thinks in little segments the, the self no then what is the self the self comes down to that life force which makes the mind alive it makes it work which makes the sense perceptions alive and makes them work which makes this body alive and we we call it the soul i came to this country in 1962 to study at the university and people questioned me when i talked about spirituality which is spirituality deals with the spirit they said what is spirit i said i we also call it soul oh we understand you mean soul mind whatever it is they thought there was no distinction between soul and mind and i said how could you confuse soul and mind when their functions are totally different the mind functions in time and space its main instrument of gathering knowledge is thinking it thinks to find out everything all thoughts require time even the smallest thought requires time it cannot function without time so how can you say that the mind is the same when soul can have an experience of intuitive knowledge without time the soul can have an experience of love without time when soul can have an experience of appreciation of beauty even in this world without time when soul can feel a joy and bliss without time all in suddenness and spontaneous how can you confuse that too they work differently they their function is different the fact that both are right now functioning alive in this body with sense perceptions and a physical body is no reason to mix them up they are still functioning separately we have experience of gut feelings sudden knowledge sudden intuitive knowledge we have all got that feeling and we also have feeling when we analyze and think this could be like that and that could be like that cause and effect cause and effect that's the mind we can use both very effectively supposing we want to use our conscious abilities fully right in this world not go anywhere we could use each of these things we could use our physical body to express ourselves to relate to the rest of creation relate to rest of people great instrument physical body it has it has got so much stuff in it it's unbelievable we can use our sense perceptions to perceive whatever we like we can go around looking for things and enjoy the beauty with his eyes and inner eyes this is something great and we can use our mind to think and direct it to think what we like mind is such a beautiful machine such a great gift to use it for thinking communication speaking talking it's all done by the mind we can use this machine so effectively then we have got our our self our soul with intuitive knowledge ability to love the greatest experiences that we can have upon this planet earth right here we don't have to go anywhere we have to understand that these great gifts given to human beings can be applied at every level of consciousness including right here but all we have to do is to know what the functions are and use them properly and most importantly use the mind properly of course we should use the body properly too you can mess up the body become so ill health unhealthy you can't use anything else keep your body healthy you make better use of it for the time the body is alive you can make your inner sense perceptions very active exercise them and they will have last a long time much longer than the physical body use them effectively 
You can use your mind very effectively by giving it directions what to think. It's wonderful. But that's not what's happening. What is happening in mind controls everything in our life here. Mind with its bizarre thoughts, with its uncontrolled activity, is telling us what to do. And we have made a machine which was supposed to be our servant and slave into our master. We become slaves of our own mind. Somebody told me a time is coming in 40 or 50 years. These computers will become so intelligent. The artificial intelligence will become so good. It will be the intelligence of thousands of intelligent people that we will use it for making all our decisions. I said, why are you waiting for that? We are already doing it now. We are using the same kind of computer, which is a mind, and that is telling us what to do. There is no difference in the two. The mind tells us what to do, and we follow it. The mind tells us what is right, we think it's right. Mind tells us what is wrong, we think it's wrong. Mind determines our morality, good and bad. Mind determines where we should be. What kind of life are we leading? We are being dragged by a machine and leading a life. What kind of life is this? We were not designed for that. This body with all this equipment in it of a mind and senses and physical body was not designed for that. It was designed to be used, body to be used for physical activity in the physical world, sense perception to be used even beyond the physical world, through imagination, go even beyond. The mind was used to, to be used to think out what you want to think and think out big concepts and big ideas and go wherever you like with the mind, at top speed. Did we do any of these things? We reversed the whole thing, cart before the horse. Instead of we taking the lead and using these things, we are allowing these things to lead us. So the mind has now become not an agency of getting knowledge, but an instrument of keeping us away from true knowledge by keeping us involved in what it can see outside. And when it has an experience generated outside of ourselves, including this physical world, which is being generated outside of ourselves, what it does, it, it looks for the most pleasurable experience. Naturally, we can understand it wants pleasure. We all want happiness and pleasure. And the mind makes certain it will look for happiness and pleasure. Mind doesn't know if happiness and pleasure lies anywhere else except outside. Therefore, the mind looks for pleasure and happiness outside. And when it finds something, good food to eat, a beautiful person to have sex with, to have a nice holiday, a vacation somewhere, it says that's the place to get happiness and gets attached to it. In other words, attachment, desire, and attachment following it, great traps for us. Because then the mind gets fixed on these. I want more of that, I want more of that. If I'm tired of that, I want more of similar thing. The mind gets into a state where we are constantly being pushed out. Then some enlightened person comes in our midst and he says, you are looking in the wrong direction for true happiness. True happiness is within you, not outside. If it was outside, and we are all looking outside, we should all be happy. Are we happy? Let's take a, let's take a poll on that. Out of, let's say out of a hundred people, how many are happy? Do you know? Not even one. <laughs> Not even one. Some people look happy. Oh, they have a lot of money, they live in big bungalows, they are celebrities and so on. Go and live two days in their house and they'll cry with unhappiness that they're going through. Because happiness and unhappiness we have divided into two kinds of experiences. One, a physical material experience. Oh, if I had more money, I'd be very happy. Or if I have a big house, I'll be very happy. If I have a new latest car, I'll be very happy. I should get the latest gadget. iPhone 7, I'll be very happy. If I have the latest of these external outside things, I'll be very happy. And then the other side is, if I could 
truly be loved by somebody, I would be very happy. If I could have peace of mind, I would be very happy. If I could understand people, I would be very happy. Now the two things are very different. One are tangible, you can see outside. The other are intangible inside. Emotional happiness is entirely internal. And those who have got tangible stuff, emotionally very unhappy. Intellectually very unhappy. Very sad. And people think they are very happy. I have been these celebrities so many times and they look so good. Some of the movie stars, you go and see them in the movies and they become your idols. Look great, how happy. But you don't see them off screen. If you see them off screen, you'll see their internal, emotional unhappiness is stronger, greater than ours. So it's not, I tell you something that actually happened. I was studying at Harvard University, subjects like economics, business, world international affairs, things like that, very worldly things. In the economics course, I asked the professor that you are teaching a principle in economics is called the law of diminishing returns. That means if you have more of something, its value keeps on becoming less. I said, is it really true? He said, yes. I said, if you love a person more and more, will it become less valuable? He said, we have never examined love in economics. <laughs> I said, why not? Okay, forget love. What about happiness? Have you examined happiness? If you are more happy, then you become less happy. He said, we haven't examined that. I said, I like to examine. Would I like to pick up a subject for research? Sure, it's a new thing altogether for us. I said, all right. Uh, we are living in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Boston area, larger Boston area. I picked up a telephone directory. I said, I'll pick up at random 1,000 names around here. And there are rich people living there, old professors, the old businessmen now, exchanging places between the university and in business. And I picked up all their names and sent them a, a questionnaire. I developed a questionnaire. I'm a student at this university. One of the topics given to me is, what gives you happiness? And on the other side of the page, please write what gives you unhappiness. So we are, I have to present a paper on what people generally, it's a, it's a random sampling, what people are happy about, what people are unhappy about. Remarkably, I got a very large response. I didn't expect, I thought 10% would be good. I got more than 50% response to my questionnaire. People got interested, what kind of subject is he studying? I found that on the list of things that make them happy were a lot of money, good house, good children, good health, all those stuff. On the opposite side they wrote, Poverty, unhappiness, poverty, living in a hut, in a small place, having bad health, disobedient children, things like that. They gave their answers. They were so common, the answers. I was surprised that a bulk of people thought these are the things that give happiness and the contrary are give, giving them unhappiness. Then I interviewed some selected ones. I selected a professor who was then CEO of a company, and he, we knew he had a lot of money. The net worth was known to us to be over 10 million or 12 million, something like that. I said, he has money. Let me go and check out, is he happy? So far as money is concerned, nothing more. We'll check up every item, which I did. But I'm giving you one example. I interviewed him. I said, sir, you say that money makes you happy. In my survey, I found you are one of the moneyed people. So that's where I come to you. Tell me, are you happy so far as money is concerned? He said, not at all. I mean, that's not what you wrote in the question there. Why are you giving a different answer now? He said, I'll tell you why. I went to Harvard where you are going studying now. I spent years, I got a doctoral degree from there. I was a professor. I have set up industry. I worked hard. I worked for his 16, 17 years 
before I could make the money and get this house in which you are sitting with me. Look at the bloke next door to me. Never went to school, never got educated, and his net worth is 20 million. How can I be happy? <laughs> can you imagine the happiness of this man dependent upon his neighbor, not upon himself? You'll be amazed when you find what is making people happier and happy, something we don't even think about. The, the whole questionnaire was so strange that I found out some of the poorest people were happiest about what they had. And some of the richest people were unhappy. That was long ago. This survey was done in the 60s. But a few years ago, the Boston University had done a survey of the same kind. And they surveyed only if rich people are happy. They only surveyed about 500 people with a net worth over 10 million. I didn't have too many of those in my response, but they examined. One man who has 100 million, he said, I'm extremely insecure about my money. If I have about half a billion, I'd be OK. It looks like there is no limit. I came, I had to do some business work to sustain an expensive wife. I mean, no. <laughs> you know, we have to manage life, karma. So even after retirement, after getting a pension, I still had to work. So I took up a job in this country. And the people I worked with, I said, I'm getting my income from my pension, and uh, a little supplement would be all right for me. OK, we'll give you 50,000 or so. I said, that's more than enough. I was expecting 20. Anyway, after some time, they said, that's 50 doesn't seem to be enough for us. We are doing such good business. They were selling cookies, manufacturing and selling healthy cookies. They tasted so bad, but people ate them. <laughs> Why? We call them healthy. <laughs> Your strange fads were going on. This is in the 70s or 80s. So they said, no, no, we should have a little more raise. We should give a raise to ourselves. Business is good. OK, we gave a raise. We had 200,000. Okay, I said, that's great. You didn't want 200,000. You crossed the 100,000 limit you had. You'll be happy now. Not really. We should have more. We developed some more business, expanded, went to other countries, sold our cookies in places like Saudi Arabia and France and Germany and Spain and made a lot more money. So we raised our salary, W-2 salary, to 2.2 million. And I said, now you're happy? Not really. <laughs> we can't buy the things we want to. I said, let's sell these businesses. And I assure you that you can live on half a million dollars annual income. It's a good income for good living. And we'll set up some artificial uh, offices in the penthouses and say we are working, but our income will really come from our investments. And I'll make sure that the investment will be of that order because I put the companies for sale. I wanted to sell for penny stocks, but uh, Mary Lynch offered $40 million for our company. I said $40 million, we'll distribute only three partners. Three partners, so we'll get, say, seven, uh, after taxes and all, seven, eight million each. It was rejected by one of the partners. No, it's not enough. I said, what happened now? You are the guys who wanted 100,000. We're talking of 7 million now. What's the problem? He says, even with our combined income, I can't buy a boat. I had to buy a small boat. Now I want to buy another boat. I said, don't you like the little boat you have in the lake? Too small. I said, which one do you want to buy? Oh, there's one in Fort Lauderdale. OK, let's go and see it. I flew with him. It was Donald Trump's boat. And he was, <laughs> he was selling it for 25 million. And 7 million were not enough. He said, we have to go up to 100 million. I am only telling you my personal experience with people with whom I worked here, that the higher you go, you are still poor. I'm still associated with a company where I was a former chairman, but now I'm just a consultant. And I still find that the members, the board members, who are the richest, 
act like they're the poorest. I'm talking only of one item, money. Same thing applies to other things. So happiness and unhappiness is not dependent upon what we think will cause happiness or unhappiness. What gives happiness is internal happiness. When you are internally happy, you spread happiness to others. Wherever you meet people, they are happy. I told a, a seminar once in the, in the 70s. I told a seminar that you pretend to be happy for one week. Just pretend. You are not actually happy. Smile, laugh and talk, no matter what your feelings are, with everybody you meet. And then tell me what kind of people you met during the week. After one week, we had a review. Everybody met happy people. People did not change. Just by acting happy, they made people happy. It's, it's amazing where happiness lies. Happiness does not lie outside. And yet the mind is constantly driving us outside to find happiness outside. We don't go inside. And I can understand. When we try to go inside with our mind, we won't go. Mind will resist. Something else must pull us inside. Not our thinking, not our understanding, not our books, not our travel, not our pilgrimages. None of these take us inside. They make us go more outside. Maybe I haven't read enough scriptures, I should read more. Maybe I should read several times. Maybe I should go to pilgrimage more often. Maybe I should go and meet that person more often. That's all outside. We don't go inside. So therefore, the, the biggest difficulty, even after reading in the scriptures, go within yourself. The kingdom of God is within you. The resonance of the soul can pull you. Love originates from the soul. Go inside the soul and check out. We don't do it. The difficulty there is that we say, what is going inside? Inside our body? Body is temporary, born and dies. How can it contain anything important in it? Okay, supposing you say, all right, there is something more in a living body and you should meditate. All right, good suggestion. Close your eyes to meditate. And it's darkness. Why? Because you close your eyes. <laughs> as simple as that. <laughs> you look, open your eyes, you saw something. So you close your eyes, it's dark. How can you see anything? Where is meditation by closing your eyes? What new information do you get by closing your eyes? You shut out the information you have outside even now. So therefore, it's so difficult we open our eyes and say at least this is better than that. Better than darkness by closing our eyes. We give up. It is not easy to turn around without any help at all. No. Mind's help? Certainly not. If there can be help from a friend whom we trust, if there can be help from a friend who, whom we trust, and he says, going within is still closing the eyes, but not merely closing the eyes. Going within means not going outside while you're going within. If you can do something which prevents you from going out, while you're going within by closing your eyes, it'll work. And the friend explains to us that I have had that experience. So that is why I'm telling you. I'm not re reading from books and telling you. Those books say the same thing. But I am telling you from experience that if you close your eyes and forget the outside, you will find true happiness. But how can we forget the outside? Whether we close our eyes or open our eyes, our mind is always thinking of other things. Well, what about thinking of what is inside? The switch? What about closing your eyes and thinking what is there? Not thinking of outside. As, a, as exercise. Not letting the mind think on its own, then it will think outside. Forcing the mind to think what is inside. Putting yourself inside. And where is inside? Inside is, when you close your eyes, where are you thinking from? 
where are you asking where am i where are you asking who am i where are you saying what is making me conscious you saying how am i alive basic questions about your own identity who you are when you close your eyes and think only of that you know what will happen you will not let the mind think of outside things if you can do it long enough especially with guidance you will even forget that you have hands and feet in your body you'll be so occupied with something in your head if you keep on doing you forget you have a body and you are still there you find you have another body which is very different from this one which you thought was the only body and that body has sense perceptions identical to these but sharper than these and those when they open up you have been using them sometimes in imagination those sense perceptions but never thought they are real you thought they are unreal because they are imaginary this is real because you can check it out by the five senses is this chair real touch it yes it's real we are always examining reality by checking one sense perception against another is this cup real yes i can drink water out of it it's real i can do the same thing in a dream too in the dream i can sit on a chair and touch it and say it's real i can also drink water and it's real i wake up it was unreal <laughs> same thing here when you are able to withdraw your attention where you are so preoccupied with what is inside in your dark space which becomes lighted space because it can become lighted any time even now you can make it lighted with your imagination and people see something with completely closed eyes completely covered you can still see things in imagination you can where is the light coming from it's all inside i am telling you simple things that everybody can check it out so when you do that these sense perceptions open up it's a new body of yours then what happens it depends on how long you can sustain that experience if it is only for a little few minutes or so few seconds or so you say there is something i don't know but you back to this reality maybe it was a great dream i had maybe my imagination thought something couldn't be real looked real at that time but not now well that is automatic at any one time our experience is only of one reality right now it's physical reality when we go there that becomes real this becomes unreal we go to sleep dream state becomes real when we wake up that becomes unreal this becomes real it is like awakening to a new level just by becoming unaware of what is outside that awakening enables you to see how the structure of this universe is being built how people are being created the deeper you go into that you can go further into the same astral sensory system go further into it it opens up even the doors of how people were created how relationships were created how karma was created not thoughts about it visualizing here is that's the whole thing can be seen in a larger context in a bigger bigger dimension than we can see here the ability to do that lies inside us right now in all of us we are equally endowed for this ability to be used so when we do that we can decide to go can you remember something what about memory the most remarkable thing memory is so such an important element we have never given so much importance to it i can make a statement which you may challenge but i can prove it to be right memory creates all experiences memory is creating this experience also <laughs> how how can i prove it can i prove it by going in or can i prove it here also i can prove it right here i'll prove it like this by telling you what is our experience of time what is time our experience of time is there is something called past there's something called present and there's something called future that's the only notion if we don't have these there's no time we have to have a past a present and a future it becomes time 
let's start with present. What is present? Before I can say the word present, it is future. The moment I start saying it's past, where is present then? Oh, present is now. How much time is in now, by the way? Let's check it out. Not even a billionth of a nanosecond. No time at all. Now in which we are living has no time. It's a meeting point between the future and the past. With no time. It's slipping. The future is slipping into the past. And we are calling it present. But we are calling, I'm talking in the present. What does that mean? It means what I have just said. What I just recently said is present. I am calling the recent past as present. It was really past. You can't have present in time. What I speak is in time, therefore it is past. Okay. So present does not exist, it is past. What about future? Does it exist? Supposing human consciousness operating through the physical body cannot hope for anything. The func function of hope disappears. Supposing the function of fear disappears. Supposing the function of anticipation of something fear finishes. All these three are the same thing. Anticipation neutral, hope is positive, fear is negative. But all same. Supposing we can't do these things in our consciousness, future disappears instantly. Ever examined this? That the future is being created by hoping, fearing, and anticipating. Nothing else. You can't have a future. And every time you hope, it is in time. It's the past. Every time you anticipate, it's the past. Because it takes time. The moment it's taken time, it's no longer present. It's gone back. And we say we're hoping now. <laughs> what is hoping now means recently. Future is past. Present is past. Past is past. And there is no way we can ever see or experience the past except through memory. We can only recall. There is no way to bring mem back, back what has happened. It's already gone. The only thing is we remember. We remember what happened a second ago, what happened a minute ago, what happened an hour ago, what happened yesterday. We are creating an experience of the past only through memory. Therefore, memory is creating the whole experience of the universe. Not only this universe. The entire universe of time and space. Whether it is here or higher levels of consciousness. Whether it is here or in the astral plane or in the causal plane. It's all memory. So how can we create this universe? Very easy. At the mental stage, where there is no physical body and no sense perceptions, in the pure mind, in the mental stage, install a little chip. I used to call it DVD. I'm becoming technologically more modern. <laughs> you install a memory chip with a pre-recorded life and install it there and play it. This whole world comes into being. It's so simple. It is designed like that. It is designed that these memory capsules or DVDs have been installed, not installed, picked up, selected by us. We picked up what would be a good series of experiences. Which DVD do we want to play, which would become our life? We install it and then we play it and it becomes our life at the astral and the physical planes. That's what we are, we are playing those right now. Some of us might question, couldn't we pick up a better DVD than what we are going through? <laughs> so why did we pick up such a horrible DVD to play in the physical world? Why did we have sickness and ill health and disappointments and so much stuff? We picked it up ourselves. We were not that stupid. It's not supposed to be if, if we are in that mental clarity and mental region. We should be sharper than that. The truth is, we were sharp. What we picked up was to have a different experience, a different experience, a completely different experience opposite to the experience of our true home, where there is no such pain and suffering, where there is no such duality, there is no pairs of opposites. We said, let's see, by creating pairs of opposites, if we can better appreciate our own original state. And 
we do not want to really go into the suffering, create it like an illusion, like a show, like a shadow, like a movie. Let's make a movie and become actors in it. This movie we see outside of the screen is away from us. So we can see we are separate. The movie we are right now acting in, we have created all the characters and decided to have a close association with the act going on by putting ourselves in one of the characters, in the head of one of the characters. That's what is happening, so we can watch better. We are doing that right now. But we are thinking that the movie is being watched by the characters. That's not true. Your body and your senses and your mind is an actor, a character. You are inside the character, not the character itself. So when I tell people, do you know you are creating this universe yourself? Then they begin to wonder, how am I creating? The character is not creating anything. You can't change anything over here. This physical body is not doing anything. Nor are the sense perception doing anything. Nor can the mind by thinking change anything. But you can, which is inside the mind, watching this show. Ultimately, the spiritual quest for finding out who you are, what the truth is, is lying within the mind, not outside. And by going within the mind, you transcend the mind and you even go beyond it. The spiritual path is not to stop only by discovering something extraordinary. Extraordinary things can be seen in this remarkable human body by putting attention in different parts of this body. You can put your attention on the six energy centers below. You get unusual experiences. They don't give you higher awareness. They don't give you happiness. They give you stra awe, strange, astonishment. And then you are back to your normal life. But to have continuous happiness, day and night, when you see the whole show from inside and know the whole show, how it takes place, you'll be so amused and happy. Your sense of humor will bloom and you'll be happy 24-7. It can actually happen and that you will carry right here. So the, if somebody is looking for happiness, if that is the goal, the best place is go within, find it. It won't be found outside. If one is looking for true knowledge, go within. It's not outside. If one wants to see the grand picture, how it could be perfect when everything else looks imperfect, go within, see the whole picture is perfect. All these goals that we have can be found within. Friend must come and tell us how to do it. Otherwise we are lost. The friend must be enlightened enough, must have had the experience, must have gone there. Is going there enough? Supposing a friend tells me, you know, I went last year to that place, I can take you there. And the friend takes me, says, oh, by the way, looks like the roads have been changed, looks like the buildings have changed, we are both lost. Not good enough. Therefore, a friend who can really guide us to this kind of destination within us must not only have gone there, he should be there when he's guiding us. He should be aware of these things while he's still there, here with us as a friend. He's in touch with that while he's talking to us here. That's the definition of a perfect living master. A perfect living master is an ordinary human being like ourselves and becomes a friend. And as a friend, while he's talking to us as an ordinary person at our level, because he has to be at our level to be a friend. Otherwise he becomes worshipful, to be worshipped, to be adored, not a friend. If he wants to be a friend, he should be like us. When he's just like us, become friend, his awareness is different from ours. And with his awareness, which is always there with him, he guides us and we never falter on the way and we never get lost. And he can take us to any level that we want to go. Some people don't want to go all the way. They don't want to discover who we are. Some people have a mental intellectual idea that if we go to the end, to totality of consciousness, what we talk of as oneness, we become one again. That's a terrible state to be in. We'll be lonely again. Then we'll again think of finding company and we'll come back again here. So 
there are all kinds of people. Some want to just go where you can see everything and get utter happiness. So there are people who can take you up to that. There are people who can take you higher. They are all called masters of the spiritual path. A master of a spiritual path can take you up to the point where he or she has gone and where you and you or anybody else who follows him wants to go. Not more. Supposing you only want to open your eyes and see there's another world inside. Good enough. There are masters who can do that. And they think that is our true home. That's final. They never go on beyond. Every stage, by the way, every stage of enlightenment, of every stage of awakening looks like final. You wake up to the first level, everything is being copied from there, everything is being created from there. You say, this is our true creator, right here. You go higher, and you say, oh, there's more. But with the mind's effort, with the mind trying to find something, you cannot go beyond the mental regions. Mind struggle can only take you as the mind goes. It can't take you beyond. The mind's limit in this, this analogy of levels of consciousness being placed one on top, it goes up to the causal region, the mental region, where the memory chips are installed, where destinies are made, where memory can run both ways, forward and backwards, a timeline can be studied both ways. Those are great experiences, but that's the end. Mind can't go beyond that. In fact, there is no way for our effort to pierce that barrier between the mental levels and spiritual levels where soul alone exists. No way. I have not seen anybody able to do that. There is a way which is somebody from beyond that should drag us and pull us up. That's the only way. And what method can we be dragged? What method do such people, such enlightened people, who have reached that level of awareness which is beyond the mind, what method do they use? They use the method that's available there. Reasoning is not available there, that's mental. Logic is not available there, that's mental. Logic is not there, that's mental. What they use is what is there. They use love, intuitive knowledge, and a sense of bliss and happiness that's only there. They pull you with their unconditional love. And they start right from here. They don't say, wait till you go to mental level, then we'll pull you up. When your seeking itself is going up to that level, somebody who says, I want to go to my true home, I'm fed up of this, I'm even fed up of all activities of the mind, I don't want to go to mental states and go to heavens and hells and see them, I'm not interested. I want to go to my true home to which I belong from where I originated. I want to see my own home, true home. Then these perfect living masters will come and guide you with your mind to go this step all the time, pulling you more with their unconditional love. Mind fights sometimes. The pull of the unconditional love is doubt, fear. Sometimes a perfect living master comes in our midst and we are afraid. Why are we afraid? I remember a friend of mine invited me to his house. He said, talk about uh, the true home. And he invited three nuns from a church that maybe they'll understand the teachings of Jesus to go within are the same teachings this man is talking about. When I started speaking, they took out their beads and said, save our souls, save our souls. <laughs> they thought the devil has come. We have been so indoctrinated with things like this by religion. And the, this spiritual path is not a religion at all. A person of any religion can practice it. And we'll find that he's practicing what his religion says. And if he does not practice, then he will only be going to the building he gives by different names. This is my church. Which church? You have to know which church. I think I should tell you a little story about which church. I'll take out my <laughs> gadget, you see. I have a little gadget to share these things, if I can find it. Which church? Give me a minute. 
Unfortunately, they send me too many <laughs> jokes every day. In my, in my library of jokes has become big. <laughs> too many. I feel like he is reading all of them to you, but no. Okay, did I find that? I'll, I'll read another one about a new pastor. <laughs> this is a story of a new pastor of a church. The young man had just graduated from Bible college and was called to pastor a church close to his hometown. The new pastor was so nervous at his first service, he could hardly speak. Before his second appearance in the pulpit, he asked his former pastor how he could relax. The older minister said, next Sunday, it may help you if you put a little vodka in your glass. It may help if you put a little vodka. After a few sips, everything should go smoothly. I will be visiting your church next week to see how things go for you. The next Sunday, the young minister put the suggestion into practice and was able to talk up a storm. He felt great. However, after the service, his former pastor pulled him aside and offered him this advice. So I'm going to read the advice given by the old pastor to the new young pastor. One, next time, sip rather than gulp. <laughs> Second, there are 10 commandments, not 12. Three, there are 12 disciples, not 10. Four, we do not refer to the cross as the big T. <laughs> Five, the recommended grace before meals is not rub a dub dub, thanks for the grub, ye God. <laughs> Six, we do not refer to our Savior, Jesus, and his disciples as JC and the boys. <laughs> Seven, David slew Goliath. He did not kick the crap out of him. <laughs> and finally, last but not least, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are never referred to as Big Daddy, Junior, and the Spook. <laughs> anyway, I was going to read something else also about different churches, which says, a man asks, which denomination you belong to? Okay, this particular denomination. Oh, so am I. Then he talks about, uh, are you of the 1921 or the 1929? No, I'm of one. Okay. They go on going further, further into it, ultimately finds he's from a slightly different place. And he's having this conversation on a bridge. He knocks the person down. You, you heathen, go down. <laughs> Just because at the end there was a little difference. The point is, somebody came to me, to my house, and presented a Bible. I said, now which Bible is this? He said, it is drawn from 14 Bibles. I said, 14? Oh, listed in the introduction. So I read, there are 14 Bibles. All variations of one Bible coming from England called, what is called the 14... Saint James version, King James version. A king decided what is the proper Bible. And here that Bible, which king said should be like that, if you look up the dictionary, is called the Word of God. You can do that with scriptures. I happen to study religion at the university as an optional subject. I study 11 religions just to get to know what's common in all the religions, maybe love, maybe devotion, something must be common. I didn't find that. The only common thing was, this is the only true religion, all else are false. And everyone said that. So you can imagine, in the seventh century, the Bible was revised by an ecumenical council. They took out whole gospels out of it and put in new ones. When a book is revised so many times, and today, we think we, by reading that book, we are going in, inside. How can we? Reading any book, for that matter. Books are 
written to describe some experiences of some people. At best, they are second-hand knowledge for us. If you have an actual experience, what is described in these books, then you can say, I understand what the book is saying. This is a commonsensical thing. A person says, I love vacations, I love vacations, and I want to go to the Waikiki Beach in Hawaii. It's a beautiful place. And he finds a book, a travel book. You can go to Waikiki. These are the plane offering. They could fly at that time, and you can stay in these hotels. And the man reads it every day. And he says, I am enjoying Hawaii. That's what we do with our scriptures. We read again and again, read again, listen again and again, and think we are getting enlightened or getting something. How can we? The actual experience is very different from reading about it. So that is why when we divide ourselves, and the mind likes to divide and separate, there was a purpose in dividing. The purpose was that the essential nature of our own totality, the oneness, the essential nature of that was love and automatic intuitive knowledge. And a joy that came from that love within itself. It was, you might say, because lack of any other description, you might say that is our essence. That's what we are. That's what God is. Well, that's what the creator is. That's what the creative power is. Creative power is love. It's not experience of love. It is love. Now you want to make that love into an experience. You create a lover and a beloved. Right there. Within itself. You can make the one into the many just for the sake of experience. And consciousness can do it. So consciousness within itself created the one and the many. Not separate. Just an experience of the many. It's like an ocean saying, I am so many drops. Drops don't go out, it's still there. We just say, this is a drop in the ocean. It was the ocean, it became a drop for the sake of being a separate drop. It remains inside the ocean. We are like that. The many is an expre experience, expression of love, of the love that is our essence. You can add more, you can divide further to have more of that experience, right up to this physical plane, which we have done very effectively. Love is still very important right here. It's very important at every level. So love is the essence of everything here. So that's why love pulls us back. That's why these perfect living masters, their main tool they use to take us back home, to reverse our direction of attention, is love. When we fall in love with them, they can dispel our doubts. Our doubts become irrelevant with that experience. So that is why it's a game of love. It's created like that and it's worked backwards like that. So it's so important to realize that the totality is being expressed through an experience of love here. People meditate. Okay. You meditate very blindly. Meditation has become now it become listening to meditative music outside. You play nice records. Sound of the seashore. Sound of bir little birds and other chirping. Natural sounds from forests. Play those. Very soothing. You think of all those things. Beautiful sir. I can hear them. I've heard many times. People present them to me <coughs> for my own good, for my meditation. <laughs> so I hear them, listen to them. Feel very beautiful, so smooth. I start imagining I am on the beach now, I am in the forest now. Where is my discovery of who I am? If you want to use meditation to feel peace and calm, good. Use it. It all depends on what you want to use meditation for. But if you want to find the truth, if you want to go back to your true home, these devices outside will keep you outside, they will not take you inside. On the other hand, there is a music inside far more melodious, far more exciting, far more alive. It is so alive, it can pull you, like, like grab you. That music is not outside. 
I have not heard any music outside. I have heard so much music that can grab you like that. Then the music of your own self is not coming from anywhere. It's coming from consciousness. It's coming from your own self, own reality. And it can be heard. It can be heard right here in the physical plane. It can be heard even better inside when you are not aware of the physical plane. Even better. Ultimately, it becomes yourself. And you discover that was not music. That was consciousness per se. It's the very source of all creation. But you have to see it gradually because right now, it can be heard like, similar to music from outside, only it has some pull in it, it has some resonance in it, which outside music cannot reproduce. So that's a great thing. People can either meditate by repeating mantras, controlling their mind, trying their best to ignore the mind, somehow hold attention inside, struggle hard, that's one way. The other way is to catch the music inside and be drawn by it, and be so drawn by it that you forget everything. I compare these two methods like a car, a motor car, which is a rear wheel drive or a front wheel drive. A car with rear wheel drive pushes the car. A car with front wheel drive pulls the car. Our struggle at meditation is rear wheel. We push it. And the music, listening to the music, is being pulled. You are not doing anything, you are being pulled by... Music is doing that for you. That is why I have always recommended that after you have struggled enough with the rear wheel drive, you will be able to reach the other one and drop everything. And the music will pull you up to higher levels of awareness. It's so powerful. So that is why the yoga which this master taught, which I followed with success. I must say that I do not share any of these teachings from books. I share them from any experience I got from this man. That's why I, I make it experiential. If I have not experienced something, I won't share with you. It's not proper for me. I'm a hypocrite then. But I do lie. <laughs> I lie all the time. <laughs> I try to tell you stories which I know are not true because there's no other way to tell the truth. Somebody asked me once, are you a liar? I said, yes. Is that, is that what you said also a lie? I said, yes. <laughs> now make up your mind. The, these are things which are not describable. So every time you describe them in word, you are a liar, really. But there's no way to communicate otherwise. So we communicate with stories, parables, stories, examples which, from the physical world. And we have to do that in order to understand simple things. So the yoga, the system of union with your own self, which he taught was called Surt Shabd Yoga. Surt means attention. Shabd means the sound. Yoga means union with the highest. Simple. Put your attention on the sound. It will drag, drag you up all the way to your true home. Simplest way. The highest. The best. I have examined so many yogas, I can't tell you, in my life. Practice them. Practice such horrible uh, 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 practices also which they are doing to find the truth. It does not lead to the truth. Surt Shabd Yoga gave me the best experience. I recommend it. If you can find a better system than being pulled by the sound within, come and tell me. I assure you I'll immediately adopt it. If you can find something better than what I got from this man, I'll take it immediately. I won't be defying his teachings because he told me, when he taught me, that what he is giving works for him. And if it doesn't work for me, I can get anything else. He gave me permission. So I'm ready to accept anything new because I got permission already from my master who taught me this way of Surat Shab Yoga. So after, but you can't get that unless you have struggled. How, how much we are enslaved to our mind 
that the mind will not believe that unless you mind will not believe that you can get something by relaxing and listening mind believes you have to work for something you have to struggle to get something the more valuable the thing the harder the struggle mind is indoctrinated like that and always wants to work to get and this path if i were to say is effortless meditation how can you make it effortless relax song is going on you're listening you're not trying to get the song you're not trying to follow a song you're not trying to follow the sound sound is pulling you you are relaxing and floating with it that's the way that's the path <clears throat> but we want to struggle so we must first struggle find the struggle useless and then listen so that's what actually happens to satisfy the mind we struggle to satisfy our minds these perfect living masters fully aware of the value of of the pull of the sound to take us up make us struggle meditate 2 hours no 2 and a half no more follow this diet follow these restrictions do this do that oh now i am on a spiritual path you see i am doing something and when this nothing works you say what kind of thing i am getting disappointed no wait this is not going to take you anywhere what is the switch if this was the only thing that masters came and said to us work hard struggle in order to switch us to listening to the sound why would we stay long enough to wait for them to switch us we stay because by that time we have fallen in love with them by that time they have already pulled us by their love and we are willing to go by the method they are telling because love is going to pull us if there was no love there was just mechanical teaching we'd give up we tried you told us meditate it didn't work when i tell such truth some people don't like it when i tell them meditation does not take you to a true home it's for the satisfaction of your mind any kind of meditation because it's an effort it's a mental game all meditation can take you up to mental regions but to go to your true home you need something else a pull by some power beyond the mind and that's what the perfect living master gives i am very happy i spent these three days with you and today is the final day is there going to be prasad in the afternoon okay we'll be uh, distributing the blessed food which i'll invoke the blessings of my master so that uh, when you it's a, it's a eatable edible thing so when you eat a little bit you remember this event you remember uh, from where the inspiration has come from baba sawan singh the inspiration is coming from there and he was a great master he's known as great master i think he's the greatest master so it's it's nice to have some memory of him <clears throat> now let me remind you this prashad which we distribute is blessed food the blessing has been invoked in giving you blessing does not change the molecular structure of the food some people try to <coughs> use it in different ways it does not become a medicine some people say we are sick we take a little prashad to get well no better take a proper medicine <laughs> this is to make you remember to make you trigger back if you have strayed away from your spiritual path you forgotten it you take a little bit it reminds you it's a trigger to put you back on track so it should be used for the purpose for it is given it's an expression of love and blessings i use it like that so we'll meet at 3 uh, o'clock for that now i'll take up a few questions if they are still left i thought there was some question left dr george aiken will read the questions what are emotions in or through spiritual perception what are emotions in our in or through spiritual perception emotions are an expression of our energetic self and if you want to trace them in this physical body where they are arising from they come mostly from the heart center the heart center carries experiences which can create emotion so for the physical thing actual experience of wakeful state 
is always taking place at the third eye center behind the eyes. When we are awake, we are there. But all the centers are working to generate different experiences. And emotion is from the heart center. If you get fired up and passionate something, it's not a spiritual practice, it's an emotion. If you are afraid, it's an emotion. If you start crying over something, it's emotion. These are all emotional reactions and they are being generated as an energetic ex expression of your own self. When you are at a spiritual center, center of awareness, not center of energy, all centers of energy are below the eyes. Center of awareness is behind and above the eyes. In the spiritual center, you become cool and calm. A calmness that you don't see out here. A peace that you can't experience here. Emotions are not peace. Sometimes they're very disturbing. They can disturb your peace. So emotions are what we call coming from the energy center in the sub astral plane of consciousness. So there is astral plane is divided into an overlap of sub-astral plane and a higher astral plane where the sensory systems work. They work in both areas. So the actual generation of emotions is there but experienced in the physical body as if they're coming from the heart chakra. In spiritual perception, we don't give importance because they're not coming from there. But in the expression of love, they play a role. When you express your love, you become emotional. When you're afraid, you're emotional. But the emotion of love leads you to thinking of the beloved, which again takes place here, and eventually the same emotions give you peace. So the emotion of love, particularly love, which we call pure love. Now what is pure and impure love? I, I said not a good classification. What I mean is, a, Physical attraction, infatuation, sexual attraction, um, just outside attraction to cover your loneliness and friendship. These are not the kind of love that I talk of. Most of them are pulling us by attachments, not by love. Attachment is different from love. And the basic difference between attachment and love is in attachment, we are always aware of two, I and you. I love you, that means I'm attached to you. What am I conscious of when I say that? I am there, I know, that's why I'm loving you, I have to be there. And you, my beloved, I love you, that's attachment. What happens in true love? In true love, you don't think of yourself. The beloved occupies the entire space of awareness. You only think of the beloved. Wow, that's my beloved, not I. You become speechless, don't say I love you. You express it in absolutely something else than words. That's true love. In true love, you identify for that moment with the beloved and not that you have a separate entity. When you have a separate entity and you say I love you, it's also involving your own ego, the I-ness. Very often, it's just an ego trip, no more than that. I love you, do you love me? No, I don't, then I hate you also. <laughs> that kind of love is just an ego trip. And we are fi finding it every day, the word love is being misused all the time. So there's a big distinction between attachment and love. Some of these emotions are created by attachment, some are created by love. And they are because we are in the physical body and we are using energies to survive and so they get mixed up with true love and the love that we are trying to express. Master, at initiation, are sanchit karmas permanently removed or given back to us at Trikuti? Which karmas do initiates have to remove at Trikuti after passing away? At initiation, are sanchit karmas permanently removed or give it back to us at Trikuti. Which karmas do initiates have to remove at Trikuti after passing away? An initiation by a perfect living master 
dissolves, burns up, finishes all sinjit karma. All reserve karma is burnt up. There is nothing from which a fresh life or fresh experience can be created except from the current life which we call pradabd or destiny. The current life destiny is only left over. When we have to remove our karma at Trikuti, we are only removing the last remnants which we did not remove here or in the astral plane. They go up to the causal plane. We remove all of them before we move further. So it's only the karma left over from paying the pralab because we can reach Trikuti in the middle of this life and still have karma. It's paid off there. There is only one form of life, a human life, in which we create karma. There are millions of lives. They count up 8.4 billion forms of life. And all those are to pay off karma, not create them. But in one human life, by constantly intending to do things, even when we don't do, we are creating karma. We create so much karma, a big reservoir develops. That reservoir is destroyed. The effect of that reservoir is it builds up our attitude. The, the karma we are going through in terms of events is called pralab or destiny. And the attitude we bring to that, how to deal with it cheerfully, worse, angrily, irritatingly, or how we do it, is created by the sanchit karma. When you are initiated, your attitude changes. It's a very remarkable thing that you suddenly say, I don't think of the things the same way. And other people notice it too. So initiation by a perfect living master destroys the sinchit completely at the time of initiation. Only the balance left over in the current problem. It can be paid off in dreams. It can be paid off in a wakeful state. It can be paid off in a next life. It can be paid off in liquidity. How do you know when something is right or wrong? Can you do something wrong and believe that it is right? How do you know when something is right or wrong? Can you do something wrong and believe it is right? Right and wrong, good and evil, all moral code is built up by your karma and our environment created by the karma including the society in which we are born, the culture in which we are born, and the value system that is being created at that time of our lifetime in any particular culture builds up our moral value. What we are taught from childhood comes up our knowledge of good and bad, of right and wrong. So when we are doing something which we have been built up to believe is wrong, it's wrong. When we do something which we have been taught to be right, we say it's right, it's right. It's the right and wrong is not being determined when we act. It has been determined before we act and we classify it right and wrong. Mind classifies it. Our intention we are doing, this is not good, but I have to do it since it's very pleasant. It's very pleasurable. The, since the mind likes pleasure, unfortunately, if you prepare a complete list of rights and wrongs, most of the time, the mind wants to do wrongs. It appears the rights are very dry, not, <laughs> not so good. Wrongs are very interesting, very pleasant. And this is, it's not, it's not an absolute thing. It's what society told us. How our growth, our education, our system told us. And we got indoctrinated, our mind accepted those values. And those values are becoming our absolute values. Our religion has taught us. Religion has divided into right and wrong. Religion has created heavens and hells. Religion has created reward and punishment. So we go through these things because we are trained to go to think like that. So right and wrong actually belongs to our mind. Thinking. What we think right becomes right. Shakespeare says, there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. so. Our thinking creates this division. If you go to states of consciousness beyond the mind, there's neither right nor wrong. It is. That's it. It just is. It was created as pairs of opposites 
and right and wrong are also pairs of opposites to experience here, right and wrong to be experienced so that we can go into a state where we don't have this different right and wrong. It's the opposite of this. It's been created for that purpose, the right and wrong. And then we have been given this free will to do right or wrong. We do right sometimes and we reward it. We do wrong, we are punished. Who punishes us? Our own mind. Who rewards us? Our own mind. And then that plays out outside as a reward or punishment. It's such a simple system. We have the ability to keep on doing right. If we, if we said, I am going to live such a virtuous life, I don't want to care what the mind wants to do, I'll just do what is right. And you live your whole life doing right. You'll be rewarded. There's a nice place to reward you, it's called he heaven. You go there, have a good time. For how long? For how long you were right? <laughs> if after that you are wrong, then you go to hell. But you never escape the system. You don't escape the system of going round and round. Whether you are punished or rewarded, you are still in the same system of reincarnation. System of remaining here. Don't escape from here. Somebody says, I want to be very virtuous so that I can be greeted by God in heaven. He will greet you. Because this is God in heaven. Whoever rules heaven is God. And people see God. He's a physical God. I mean, not physical, astral God. You can see him. So they get that, they enjoy, then back to the circle again. Do you know, in one lifetime, one can do such horrible thing and such a good thing that immediately after that life, he goes to both heaven and hell. In fact, when you are dying, if you have done such two things, that you deserved heaven for some good thing you did and hell for another bad thing you did, it was so extreme, that's the last choice of free will you ever get. You're dying, where do you want to go first, heaven or hell? <laughs> it's destined because of your actions, one month in heaven, one month in hell. Let me ask you, supposing you had this choice, would you go to heaven first, those who say heaven first, please raise your hand. Hell first, more want to go to hell. <laughs> Can you imagine? Simple example right here. And I can understand the point of view in the mind of both sides. Those who said heaven first, they think maybe they could avoid hell somehow. <laughs> Those who said hell first, they said let us get this out of the way, otherwise our heaven will also be like hell. <laughs> I understand both points of view. But to be a human being, you have to have mixed karma, good and bad. If you don't have a mixed karma, you go to heaven or hell. If it's entirely good, heaven. Entirely bad, hell. You can't become a human being. How do you become a human being? Mixed. Little good, little bad, little punishment, little reward. How does this combination help us? It helps us because it's only in human form. Only in physical world, in physical human form, we have the experience of what we think is real free will. We don't have it in heaven, we don't have it in hell, we don't have it as an animal, we don't have it as a tree. No other form of life has it except a human form. And this human body, the human form, is the only way in which that experience of free will can make us a seeker. And by seeking, we can get out of the system. That's the importance of a human life. Biggest importance of human life. And if you say, what's the purpose of being human? That's the purpose. You can use your free will to seek. Seek your ultimate home and you'll find it. Arrangements pre-exist that if you are a seeker of the ultimate truth, perfect living masters will come and pick you up. They'll come by coincidence, by chance, into your life and take you back. It's the reward of your seeking. It does not come in any other life form. Somebody had asked me the other day a question. What about this Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, they talk about the creator, the sustainer, the destroyer. Are they gods or are they positions which one can occupy? <coughs> they are positions. They are souls. 
like us. Good karma made them those for a certain time. The time is over. This long time, but time is over. Back in, in now, if you believe in Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, the Hindu mythology and Hindu religion, then I can also tell you that Krishna is considered Lord Krishna. They call him worshipped as the avatar of Lord Vishnu. He is Vishnu in human form as Krishna. And what is Krishna doing? As a little boy, he is in charge of going and taking care of the cows. The cow, he's like a cow herd, taking care of cows. And there's another friend of his called Udo. And they both go together. But he's enlightened. From childhood, he's talking very spiritual things. While they're, talk, while they're walking, he tells Udo, he says, Udo, the nature of karma is very strange. There is no atonement. People think we can atone. That if we do a bad thing, we can do good things to cover it up. There is no atonement. You do good things, you can get rewarded as much as you like, but not just erase the bad thing. A very strange nature of karma. And all of us are trying to some, somehow get atonement. And then he points out, Udo, this little ant which you see here, watch it carefully. This ant one time was Brahma, the creator of this universe. This ant one time was in the, the heaven, the Lord, Lord of one of the heavens. Because of his karma prior to that, he's an ant today. If this can happen to Brahma and Vishnu and these people, then karma is a very powerful trap for us. And that's how it traps us. Given free will to escape. We are using free will to get more and more into the trap. What greater subtle trap can there be to make this alive? Who is doing it? Who is responsible for it? We are responsible for it. Because we are the ultimate source of all experience. We created this terrible experience of a trap in order to escape from it and enjoy our true home much better than we ever did before. Pairs of opposites. Pairs of opposites we are applying to our true home where there is no pairs of opposites by creating this whole universe like that. This amazing situation that the law of karma is holding us. It is holding what? Is it holding our soul? Is it holding our true self? No. True self, our soul has no karma, ever. The karma is a play of the mind. Choice and free will which we are doing, using here, the illusion of free will is a mental free will. It's exercised by the mind. Karma is entirely a mental experience. The moment you rise above the mind, there is no karma. The mind creates good and bad, the mind creates karma, the mind keeps us here. Escaping from the mind is escaping to our true home. Therefore, don't believe this your karma. This karma on a machine laid it on. When you leave it, you go out. And how do you go out? By use of a particular keys in the machine called free will and you seek through them. It's so built in a beautiful way. If you want to escape, you can. But to escape from the mind, you have created the experience predestined experience that when you are ready to leave that arrangement will come into play of a perfect living master coming into your life. It's as simple as that. You have prearranged it. It's not a coincidence or chance that's happening. It's prearranged that when you are tired of this show that's been created, not to go back home but you are lost because you have become unaware of your true home, unaware of the route to the true home, then a perfect living master will appear and take you back home. That's, that's, that's a great thing too. That you can have an experience which can be so horrible t a trap, and yet to escape from the trap is also within it. What is holding us back more than anything else, even, as you, even with use of free will, is our ego, our I-ness. I am doing this. When you say, I, I, I am doing this, you're keeping yourself separate from everybody, including God. 
That's why sometimes I wonder, what was the purpose of religions in this world? Religions don't come to unite, they come to separate. Not only separate between ourselves, to separate us from each other, by saying, I belong to this denomination, you don't. I belong to this religion, you belong to another, so I am on another track, you are another. Separation. We even separate from God by religion. Religion says God is somewhere else, we have to search for him. So the religion is playing a very important role, working for separation, not for unity. Whereas our truth is a unity into oneness. Our true home unites us, it takes us, makes us one, and we know the show is taking place within the one. The role of religion, which is supposed to be a spiritual role, has become a non-spiritual role because they've all followed separation as a policy. We are separate from God, we are separate from each other. We keep up the distinction. You do this, we don't do this, no, you go away. You are all heathens. You are non-believers. If you don't believe in my faith, you never go to God. Only through my way you can go to God. What is separation? What is the truth about a spiritual seeker? He is born in a religion, born in a culture. Does he have to denounce that religion? Does he have to leave it to, in order to be a spiritual? Not at all. I have come to the conclusion spirituality has nothing to do with religion. The spirituality is an exploration of your own self. Where does religion come into it? Spirituality is to find the spirit, your soul. Where does religion come into it? The religion says if you give tithes, we'll take care of your soul. The more the donations, the more we'll take care of you. I was surprised how many evangelists or those who are going to help you to go to your true home are saying, send $20 and we'll pray for you and take you back home. Very cheap. <laughs> $20. And it's a big business. So even spirituality is becoming big business. Where money is involved, where it costs physical money to buy something, it has to be physical. How can it be spiritual? That is why in the tradition of my master, a perfect living master never charges anything for his spiritual service. Never. As a disciple of his, I have never charged for any spiritual advice I have ever given to anybody. Not only that, people have invited me to give a talk on, a, on something else, say on economics. And I'm giving a talk at a, at a university on economic development in the Far East. In the middle, somebody asked me a question which is spiritual. And I answer it, I deny the fee for the whole lecture. I'll not take it. Because in the middle, a spiritual question came. I'm not going to violate an old tradition that we are givers, not takers. Spiritual tradition requires that these people with that kind of awareness have come to give, not to take. Of course, they make their earning, they have to survive as human beings, and they do all kind of business, they work just like others, and they survive. But for their spiritual teachings and for their spiritual dissemination of knowledge and for helping people to get initiated and to go back to their true home, no physical fee is ever charged. Another kind of fee is charged. And that is, surrender your mind. That's much worse, I don't do think. Some people think that these spiritual teachings are just to control your mind. Yeah, they are. So it's a cult. <laughs> if somebody comes and controls your mind and says, follow me, he is hypnotizing you to follow him, it's like a cult. There's a big difference between the work that these perfect living masters do and the cultists do. Major difference I have noticed is these masters say we are giving you a way to escape from here, examine it, don't like it, go. The cult says you are part of us, if you go out, we'll kill you, we'll punish you. 
if we can't punish you, God will punish you. That's a cult. Cult is like a trap. It, it requires great allegiance, as if you're married to that cult. You have no freedom to even look out. So the difference in cults and this teaching is, this teaching is open. Try it out. Does it work? Try something else. Something works better? Tell us. We'll also follow it. It's that open. So that is why there's a big difference in these teachings, spiritual teachings, and the setting up of cults, which, treat, which are just little organizations that bind you into it and don't let you move out. Any other question? Sorry, I went out into a new lecture. <laughs> Dear Master, yesterday you said anybody could be a perfect living master. So how can you identify a perfect living master? Yesterday you said anybody could be a perfect living master. So how can you identify a perfect living master? We are all perfect living masters, but we don't know it. When we know it, then we can say we are perfect living masters. <laughs> it's a question of knowing who you are. The moment you know what you are, who you are, really speaking, you are the same as a perfect living master. The difference between us and a perfect living master is he's aware of everything, and we are not. We are blocked in our awareness and are confined to a single awareness of one reality of the physical world. And they are aware of all the worlds and all the levels, including our true home. That's the only difference. Because they are aware all the time, they can guide us, take us, help us, even talk to us, even of those regions, which we can't do, because we speculate. They talk from facts. They talk with authority, because they are not talking from literature or from remembering or memory or something. They are talking of what is actually there. So we can all be like perfect living masters, yet we can never recognize a perfect living master because they are ordinary. They don't proclaim, I am a perfect living master. A man who says that is a huge ego trip. <laughs> I can do this for you. Look at the eye in that case, how big it is. These perfect living masters not only are functioning like ordinary human beings, they never claim they are masters. They claim they are servants of their masters. They claim they are just doing service. They are not doing anything more than that. They never take credit for them. They can perform the biggest of miracles. And you say, how did you do it? I don't know. My master must have done it. <laughs> These masters make an example of humility. Make an example of what they can do without taking any credit and passing it on. They have removed the I from their life. The I has been replaced by their master. And the master works everything. Even though, even though they are identical with their master, even though there's no difference between them, even then just to maintain this tradition of humility so it doesn't get mixed up with ego, they will give credit to the master. So you can't identify them, but you can seek them. You can find them by seeking. And by seeking, you say, where can I seek? I've gone to this place, this place, this place. I met many masters. I can't even find who is a master. They all look the same. A, a friend of mine, a seeker, actually wrote to me. He says, I've been searching for masters. And I found many. How do I select one? I said, you are very lucky. You found many. People don't find even one. The master out of those who we have find, the one who pulls you the most with his unconditional love, follow him. I thought I'd given him a good answer. He wrote back, two of them are pulling me at the same time. <laughs> now what shall I do? I said, we can't find one master who pulls us with love and you found two, you're very lucky. Try any one of them. <laughs> so the question here is, that we can only identify the master when an experience takes place. First, a seeking comes in us. We want to seek something. It's not here. We are fed up here. This is not us. This is not our place. That must come first. 
then we are seeking. And people come across and we try to study books, we try to meet people, coincidences keep on happening, taking us towards something. And ultimately, we find different teachers and they teach us different things. We keep on pursuing, but not this, not this. I'm not satisfied yet. I've learned a lot, but I'm not satisfied yet. I keep on going. Ultimately, a person comes who fills you with love and takes you further. This is it. Then, after this is it, he takes you up to a point. Great, but I wanted more. He was a master, good master, who took me so high. But I wanted more. Where can I find him? Coincidence, another master appears. By chance. And he pulls you further. With a, such an unconditional love you never experienced before. <laughs> after that, after having all these experiences, so therefore, then you get pulled to that level. Finally, when you are satisfied, say, this is it. And there's no more further seeking left. You found a perfect living master. So that is how we can identify at the right stage. But if one says, I can look around and see where is perfect living master, he can pass next to you, you'll not know it. Dear master, what should one ask from the master? What pleases the master most? And how can we make him happy? What should one ask from the master? What pleases the master most? And how can we make him happy? You can ask anything from the master. Anything you like. Whatever comes into your head, you can ask. He won't give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> He'll give what he thinks is right for you at that moment. <laughs> But you can ask. There's no limitation on asking. And you should ask. If you are a beginner on the spiritual course, you should ask. If you have advanced for a time, you don't have to ask. You will be near a master, you will know what you're going to ask. Questions will not come from your tongue. You feel, he already knows. And if you don't feel, but you think he knows, he'll give you an answer he knew <laughs> before you spoke. So there are stages at which we ask. And we can ask for worldly gifts. We can ask for good health, ask for promotions in our jobs. We can ask for uh, better relationships. We can ask for children. We can ask for uh, better children. We can ask a child to start listening to us. We can, we can ask so many things. Our mind is full of things we can ask. Ask them all. Whatever comes to you, he'll give you what is right for you according to the karmic pattern which is making you go through. And then accept. If you want to really follow a perfect living master, ask anything, then accept what he gives. And you'll be okay. Later on, you will not need to ask anything. You will know that he knows you without asking. You will know he'll give you what is best for you. And he has seen the whole picture. When a perfect living master looks at us, he does not see what we think he's seeing. We think he's looking at our face. He's looking at our body. No, he's looking at our entire spectrum of karma, which, which we've gone through, which we're going to go through, which is happening now. He's looking at the whole picture of our individual self. Therefore, he knows much better what we ought to have at that time, then we know. If you accept what Master gives, your life and spiritual life run smoothly. You can test it out. But if you want to fight it, then you get disturbed. You get disturbed because what you were asking for, which you're not given, itself was disturbing you. And then the fact that you did not agree with the Master will be further disturbance. Oh, I, I was disobedient, I didn't do this. You added on to your trouble. But if you accept what he says, everything runs smoothly. How can you make the master happy? How can you please your master? By following what he says. Nothing pleases the master more than agreeing and acting upon what he advises. 
the better you can do it, the more pleased he is. Can you give, a friend of mine asked, great master, he said, master, you are giving so much joy, happiness to all of us, but we don't give you anything. What can we give you? Master said, if you are getting happiness, and if you give me appreciation for what you're getting, I'll be very pleased. If you appreciate the gifts you're getting from the Lord, that appreciation is the best gift you can give to the Lord. That is why appreciate, how do you appreciate? With gratitude. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Do you know what we get from these masters? If you said thank you, thank you on your tongue for your life, it's not enough. That's how much they give us. So, if you can express gratitude in any way, that's the best gift you can give to a master. Appreciate and say thank you. I'll uh, break now for uh, lunch break and I hope to come back to you at 3 o'clock again. This will be the end of the program and Prashad will be distributed at 3 o'clock. After that, with the remaining time I have with you, I'll try to take up more people on the interview list. There's a big interview list and all of them I cannot take. I would suggest to those who are coming to the Great Master's Bandara on 2nd April in Rice Lake, Wisconsin, which is a big event. And there I have set apart two complete days just for personal interviews and questions personal questions on one-on-one. -on -one. So if you are coming there, that will be a better opportunity to ask questions or have a personal meeting. You'll get more than two minutes there. <laughs> <laughs> we want, I started off with giving 10 minutes, then we cut to five minutes, cut to three minutes, I cut to two minutes and still we can't complete the list. That is why this idea came up to give whole days just to this. After the event, those who go only for a day and they have to go back, we do find two minutes. But those who want a longer time and discuss things, then they, then they should make a plan to stretch out their stay for another day and they can get more time there. So, also, people talk of initiations or reinitiations. People are initiated, but they want to be reinitiated because they want to make more progress from where they were. That also takes place on the 2nd of April on the day of the Bandara of Great Master. And this year, it will be again in, in Turtle, back. Turtle Back, Turtle Back Golf Course. Not on the golf course, but inside. <laughs> it will take place on the uh, Turtle Back uh, Golf Course in Rice Lake, Wisconsin. Uh, it will start, the program starts on 31st of March. 31st or 30th? 30. 31st. 31st are the board meetings? George, what day are the board meetings? Board meetings are 31st? So the, that will be the board of the Institute for, uh, which runs these programs, Institute for the Study of Human Awareness, ISHA for short. They, their board meetings are scheduled for 31st. So the open meetings will start from the 1st of April, Bandara will be 2nd of April, and then there is some seva which we can do. Seva is also quite equivalent of doing meditation. You do the same way, your ego gets suppressed with the seva. So that'll, then we have two days of interviews, right? Yes. Okay, I'll be, I'll be very happy to see those of you who come there. Thank you very much, I'll see you at 3 o'clock.